Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Todd Vision. I'm the chair of the board of directors for Dryad, and I want to uh, just welcome everyone to uh, our first virtual community meeting. We've had a tradition of hosting annual uh, meetings for our members and the broader community uh, every May, uh, coupled with a membership meeting at which we do some um, business with the membership. And uh, we've always done them face-to-face. We've had them uh, in Washington, D.C., and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Oxford in the past, coupled with uh, various events. Uh, and uh, this is our, our experimenting with uh, the Brave New Virtual World. We're uh, really pleased to have this um, platform from, uh, from Digital to, to work with, and uh, we're, we're interested in your feedback and how, how well this works for you as a way to uh, keep you all informed. And uh, to uh, engage you with the issues that are of relevance to all of our stakeholders about data. Um, so uh, the program is not too dissimilar to what we've had in the past. We'll have a community perspectives uh, forum, which is the um, the meat of the program at the end, uh, with uh, three speakers: uh, uh, Rhiannon and Meaden from the Royal Society, Erica Newton from the uh, British Ecological Society, and Amelia Bruna from Biotropica. They've all uh, taken leadership at their societies and journals around data policies uh, in various directions, and so it's a chance to hear and compare notes and help spread good practices among the membership. Um, and uh, we'll start with um, a introduction to Dryad, we'll call Dryad 101, which is uh, going to be fairly concise, but if you're uh, new to the organization Dryad or the Dry Digital Repository, um, you'll get uh, an overview of what it's about and hear about some of the recent accomplishments and things that are uh, coming up, coming down the road. And as always, we hope these meetings will be a chance for you to ask questions of us and to um, poke us and, and uh, suggest things that we uh, could be doing better or might be doing in the future, uh, so it's a chance for the membership and for our community to help shape the organization and what the repository does. So I will turn it over um, to our executive director, Meredith Moravati, who uh, will introduce the platform we're working with and how to interact um, with us and the speakers, and uh, we'll present uh, Dryad 101. Meredith? Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody who's logged in uh, this afternoon. As Todd mentioned, we're uh, very eager for feedback after this session to see how you like this uh, new format that we're experimenting with. Um, a little background on myself. Um, I am the Executive Director of Dryad and have a background in association management where I've um, been working in member outreach and board engagement for just over eight years and also have a background in journal marketing publishing uh, with uh, Oxford University Press and in the way back publi uh, Blackwell Publishers. Uh, I've been working this past year on sustainability goals on behalf of Dryad, and I'm going to take some time this afternoon to talk to you about Dryad as an organization. I'll describe a bit about Dryad's beginnings, about our focus on data that does not have a natural home, how we integrate with journals and what happens to data we receive. And I'll mention some recent accomplishments for the repository and then move to a short business meeting portion before we get into the panel speaking. Um, then we'll get into those panel topics. But just to start off a little sort of instruction and housekeeping, this system today allows for, to, for our participants, for you all to submit questions in writing in a question box and we'll go over these questions after each speaker, and we'll likely have some time at the end of the uh, program today to go over more questions and comments from the audience. So feel free to put in questions as they occur to you, and we'll pull them out um, in between uh, speakers for a break. So to start off, this lovely sh slide shows our international representation of Dryad in our board of directors. A key takeaway here is that Dryad is a nonprofit organization that is governed by individuals from a variety of institutions with a uh, variety of expertise. The nonprofit model is one of stakeholders rather than shareholders. And Dryad's vision is to promote a world where research data is openly available, integrated with the scholarly literature, and routinely reused to create knowledge. 
where our mission is to provide the infrastructure for and promote the reuse of data underlying the scholarly literature. Now, what's the motivation of Dryad? Well, this uh, slide shows that specialized repository infrastructure exists for certain data types, such as DNA sequences or species occurrence data, but vast quantities of valuable data comprise the long tail, much in, in idiosyncratically formatted spreadsheets or other files that are present in most research but do not necessarily have a natural home. And the image on this slide shows a table of tidal observations from a very early Royal Society journal. This is an example of uh, orphan or long-tailed data. For instance, a page or two is fine to print and evaluate, but many researchers now analyze very large files on a routine basis. So Dryad was developed as a place to provide a home for orphan data and enable all data underlying a publication to be archived and accessible in perpetuity. Now, here's a few examples of data that do not have a natural home of their own and without the kind of infrastructure that Dryad provides could be lost. These are actually featured data. These are regular tweets we send out that highlight the breadth of the data we see in Dryad, promote data publishing and reuse, and also contribute to conversations online. Uh, the set on the left from the Royal Society is a study on urban sounds and related social media posts to map out possible relations between sounds and emotion. And the set on the right is also a study that collects social network data. This time it's around a disaster event, Hurricane Sandy, and it's from PLOS and looks specifically at disaster awareness and makes recommendations on possible improvements for recovery and planning. So these two examples plus the earlier one from the Royal Society show that those are uh, very important data sets that could be used for planning or government planning or policy development in a variety of disaster, public sectors, and other, um, other needs. And now with Dryad's infrastructure, these data sets are curated and linked to the article and then preserved further for reuse. Now the origin of Dryad was policy. The Joint Data Archiving Policy was adopted by about a dozen editors who led the field in evolution and life science, and they came to an agreement that data are important products of research, they should be deposited in an appropriate public archive, but there can be considerations for um, special situations or embargoes. The JDAP policy was effective in part because it's high-level, basic, and concise, so it's a natural starting point and creates the beginning of author instructions. Now this policy can be used as a jumping off point for community to decide how to get into the details, some of which we'll talk about today. For instance, how do you handle embargoes? Or what is the public archive of choice for your community? Or how do you clearly communicate instructions to authors? And what other needs will arise from archiving data and reusing it? For instance, for citing data. So how effective was this policy? Well, this is taken from a study of phylogenetic data to see how data availability was impacted by JDAP and compare it to the National Science Foundation's policy requiring data management plans that was introduced at the same time. The vertical axis shows the proportion of data that was available from articles published between the years of 2002 and 2014 which is shown along the horizontal. The first block illustrates when papers were funded by the National Science Foundation, but were in journals without JDAP, there was a minor increase in availability after 2011. Contrast this with the middle block, when papers were published in a journal that put JDAP into practice, even if they were not funded by NSF, the post-JDAP increase was very impressive. The availability of data increases from less than 10% to over 80% in just a few short years. So what makes the difference is good, clear policy and infrastructure to support it. In these cases, the infrastructure was mainly Dryad and other specialized repositories. For other communities, preferred infrastructure could be different. So how does Dryad work? How do we accomplish supporting that orphan data? Dryad has integrated with almost 95 journals. This is one workflow. 
the one in which we took data after the article has been accepted and on its way to being published. Now there's more workflows that allow you to have data during review or even before manuscript submission. With Dryad submission integration, there's a metadata exchange between the repository itself and the journal's manuscript submission system. This exchange has a variety of technical options. You can do this via email or a deeper API. It ensures bi-directional linking of article and data, and at the end results in an article with its cross-ref DOI linked to a data set with its data site DOI. The benefits are simple data deposition. It frees the author from providing detailed metadata. It's all provided accurately and automatically. Links are created and resolve according to the journal's preference and permanently point to each manuscript. Data can be used during the review process by providing anonymous and private access to the data and the ability to, the ability to support a variety of journal policies like embargoes or other options. And of course, integration is open to scientific and medical journals. You don't need to be a Dryad member or um, sponsor DPCs in order to set this integration up. Now, our curators really are wizards behind the curtain, as can be seen um, in the blog post that's linked here. They are an essential part of the infrastructure that provide customer assistance, data checks, and work to ensure quality control on submissions, ensuring data are available for discovery and reuse in the future. And as you can see from a small sample of tweets, they have their own fan base. After data comes to Dryad and is on the way to being published, our curators evaluate submitted data files, ensuring that files can be open and are virus-free, that there are no intellectual property issues, there's no identifiable human subject data or endangered species location data, and submissions and supporting documentation are in English. They create accurate, standardized, sufficient metadata and handle things such as embargoes or modifying data packages or files after submission or publication as needed, and also uh, versioning. So you can see that quality curation really is at the heart of what we do. Now, moving on to some of the accomplishments we've had this year, we at Dryad are super excited to welcome new partners and increased participation from current partners. Fifteen new journals integrated their manuscript submission system with the Dryad data submission process just last year, and we also welcomed an institutional partner from the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. But the big story in 2015 was more published data overall. Last year, we published 45% more data in Dryad over the previous year. These uh, data sets were from articles in over 230 different journals and averaged just under three and a half files per data set. And last year, Dryad blew past the 10,000 mark in total number of data sets in the repository. We are now up to over 12,000 data sets linked to publications housed in Dryad. And more data packages released in 2015 translates to more data openly available for verification, reuse, to create new data sets from them, and to support the scholarly integrity of their associated articles. However, the biggest growth in 2015 was size. The average size of a Dryad data set increased by a whopping 127% last year. This is one reason why at the start of 2016, as part of our new pricing structure, we opted to double the maximum package size before overage fees kicked in. Previously, overage fees started at 10 gigabytes, and now they do so at 20 so we believe that it's imperative that researchers have the ability to archive all the data underlying their published findings and to do so affordably. More data and larger files means that the understanding of what should and can be archived is expanding and that Dryad is now seeing a wider range of data than ever before. General interest journals take up in Dryad is one reason we have more variety of data sets. Integration with PLOS, BMJ Open, and others have brought us more data that fall outside the life science and evolution field. An example of this is the recent Sci-Hub data set in Dryad from the paper that recently came out in Science. So Dryad holds not only peer-reviewed data, 
but also support science journalism. We support vetted content. Our authors and editors are gaining an expanded idea of what Dryad can and should serve and what should be openly preserved and are in turn archiving more data and more complex pieces. In addition, the rise of data papers often need the support of well-curated data. They are specifically published for reuse and are a good model to aspire for for documentation or quality control and metadata needs. And these data papers also help the community understand the value and importance of data citation practice. So more and larger data sets, a larger variety of researchers served, more partners, and continued quality curation. Marks, 2015. Now to switch gears for just a minute and ask for some participation from you all, the group online today, this webinar format also allows us to open a polling question to you, and we have one on the subject of preprints. Preprints are really gaining traction. BioArchive apparently sees about 400 per week, and there are talks on these subjects at publisher meetings, such as the recent Council for Science Editors, and also Crossref recently announced support of preprints. And at Dryad, we've been asked for a while about depositing data in support of preprints. So this is growing, and we'd also like to hear a little bit from our members. So I put open a poll, and it, the question is, Dryad has perceived demand for data in support of preprints. This is implications, has implications for how data integration and payment works. So do you think Dryad should be getting into the area of supporting preprints? And we will come back to the answers of what you all choose in a little bit. Now we'll switch tones just for a moment for the short business portion of the Dryad business meeting with just a few slides about membership and sponsorship. As a membership organization, Dryad owes a debt of thanks to our body of members. These members can receive discounts on data publication charges, they can vote on board nominations and bylaws, and help guide and shape the organization and the future of research. We are grateful for our members and thank you very much for your support and participation. If you have not yet voted on the current slate of board members and bylaws that are in front of you and you've received by email, please do so now with the email information you have already received. And thank you. Now participation in Dryad is open to all organizations, and there are a variety of ways that you can get involved. You can join Dryad as a member. Members provide financial support with dues and governance support with their votes. Members receive recognition on slides at multiple talks throughout the year, as well as on our website, highlighted as a supporter of quality data. They're also invited to participate in meetings and collaborate in events such as these today. Another way to participate is integration, which I spoke of earlier. You can integrate your journal with our system. Integration does not currently have a cost associated with it. It allows for easy data support for files that do not have a natural home, and it takes advantage of the setup in a variety of manuscript submission systems. And a third way is to choose to support data publication charges. Our sponsors are organizations who are committed to making it easy and affordable for their community to publish data. Now a note on sponsoring data publication charges or DPCs. We are noticing that subscription plans are becoming increasingly popular as publishers desire to cover all their journals under one plan. And as many note that the number of data published with their articles are increasing. Now if no plan is in place, researchers are prompted to submit payment information at the time of data submission. This is held in a secure system that only charges when and if the article and data are published. For some of our sponsors, it's kind of an experiment on how or even who will pay for the data. Oftentimes, our sponsors want to get their toes wet so that they, so they opt for a small voucher plan and an increase might happen later. We are seeing this happen and encourage it. We want, to work for our, we want this to work for our partners regardless of what stage they are at. So we encourage feedback and any level of participation for support of DPCs. 
Membership and DPCs all go to help Dry to achieve a sustainable business plan. And as the final blog post in 2015 shows, we are on our way, but this is not without some challenges. We have experienced growth in revenue and data, but we still need more growth to fully sustain operations from the DPC. Plans are to enable all data publication charges to support the management of the repository and to look for grants to target special projects, research and development, and pilot partnerships. If anyone today has any suggestions or ideas, we certainly welcome your feedback. One project we're excited about that we're currently involved with is the Technical and Human Infrastructure for Open Research, or THOR. This is a two-and-a-half-year project funded by the European Commission. THOR's core mission is improving the tools available to connect data that sits in repositories like Dryad to the scientific literature. And this will be accomplished by strengthening the op interoperability between identifier services like Datasite, which we use to mint DOIs like ORCID, which we use to provide unique identifiers for researchers and other players in the larger ecosystem, such as Crossref or Europe PubMed Central. With this partnership, we are hoping, or rather helping, to overcome some of the technical obstacles to data citations and helping to build the necessary infrastructure for researchers to receive credit for making their data available and having it reused. Now, for more information about specific partners or numbers and general finances, you can follow a link to our annual report it's one of the documents in the resources tab of this window. And always, as always, let us know if you have any questions. And as a final reminder to our members to please vote. So that does it for the Dryad Overview and Business Meeting. Now let's look at this poll and see the results. So it looks like the results, and this is very interesting, are fairly split. We've got a percentage of people, 52%, think that Dryad should be getting into the area of supporting preprints. But it also looks that there's a significant portion that aren't quite sure either the role that preprints have in scholarly communication or the importance of data support for preprints. This is Todd. I was just uh, saying uh, we'd love to hear thoughts on why people voted one way or the other if they feel strongly. Um, about the, the preprint question, or we can we have a few moments uh, if there are any other questions. Uh, we have one question here. Um, so, does the forty dollar per article for members apply to articles that do have data stored in Dryad? Okay, that was a question from Robin. That's a good question, um, Robin. That price is for members, and it is a member price for articles that do have Dryad stored in Dryad. So yes, that's a, um, an example of our subscription plan for uh, our partners who are doing an unlimited subscription over a period of, of time. That uh, dollar per article levies a fee per article published per the journal, and then you can um, publish as many data sets as you wish during that period of time. Right, so I, th I, th I think maybe the beginning of that answer may have misled. So the, the, it's $40 per published article whether or not the data is in Dryad. Yes, Correct? yes, that's, right. Yes, that's right. right, as a subscription model. So if right. a journal is under a subscription model and, say, publishes 100 articles per year, that's how that model is, is assessed, and then you're able to upload as many data sets <clears> as you wish. So it, it works in the cases uh, best where the, the journal is heavily reliant on, um, on Dryad as a repository. If, uh, if it's just a minority of the, um, the data would go to Dryad, then uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be economical. There's a calculator, I believe, on the um, uh, Dryad website that allows you to play with the plans and sort of the proportions of articles that have data and see what the um, consequences would be for those. All right, uh, next question from Stuart Taylor. What's the subject discipline split among the data sets in Dryad? Well, um, 
Stuart, we surely have um, a large amount of data in Dryad that is skewed towards the journals that have integrated and have done so early in Dryad's um, origin. Because if you, once you set up the integration process and you re remove some of the barriers of publishing data, it becomes more and more, and more easy for, publish for our authors to come, and we get more and more data from those particular journals. For instance, Dryad has data from uh, around 470, I believe, different journals, but we're integrated currently with 95, and those 95 are heavily skewed in the life science evolution field, although we certainly have um, recently uh, integrated last year with PLOS and some more, um, you know, general science journals. Uh, but the vast majority of Dryad's content does skew towards those early integrations. As far as a specific subject discipline split, I can't say um, off the top of my head. That would be interesting to look more depth. But you can do a search in Dryad and look at different keywords, do, look by publisher, look by year, and so forth. All right, next question from uh, Monica Moniz. Is there any type of data set, images, et cetera, that you don't archive? Monica, one of the things that we do return is, of course, data that has um, um, identifying information, um, personal identifying information from uh, a study, or possibly species location, rare, rare species location data. Uh, in those cases, we'll return those to the author and ask them to um, remove that. Um, we also advise uh, our authors when they provide us with data sets that are better served by specialized repositories. Uh, but we don't necessarily return those um, per se. We kind of let, let that be up to the journal policy and the author and the editor. All right. And from Ian H., how long does the curation checking process by our editors take on average for each article? Hi, Ian. That's a good question. And we find that that, um, that, pers that time really does change depending on where we are in our curation employment life cycle. So when we're bringing on new curators and spending more time training them, it takes a little longer. And when we're well-staffed with curators that have been um, working with us for a period of time, it gets much, much more efficient. We, we, look, we monitor this pretty regularly. Right now it looks to be about 30 minutes to, at the most, about an hour on average for each article. Now, of course, some of them take us quite a long time and some of us can be, some of them can be quite basic. So that, you know, that's an average number to useful as the way those are. Great, thanks. Uh, and from Linus Svensson, uh, what proportion of participating journals have a mandatory requirement for data deposition and what proportion is strongly recommending it? That's a good question, Linus. I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure, Todd, if you can shine a little bit more light on that. We certainly um, were helped along by um, the JDAP um, policy adopters, which were, as I said, I think 11 or, or 12 different journal editors who did make data um, uh, publishing data as a um, requirement of publishing in their articles. So we did have that good start of a mandating policy. But now that we're yeah. um, accepting data from a lot more, we're taking um, data from journals and publications that have a variety of different kinds of data policies. It's a, it's a great question. It's really hard to stay on top of this um, because these kind of change quietly behind the scenes a lot among a lot of the partners and journals that, um, that come to Dryad. So uh, our snapshot is obsolete generally by the time we um, we go through that, which we've gone through on several occasions in the past when people have tried to study the effect of mandatory deposition versus recommended and so on. I think, uh, I don't know if um, Erica plans to talk about it, but uh, British Ecological Society did something uh, interesting in kind of starting with an encouragement policy for a year or two and then um, moving to a required policy if, if uh, as kind of a default if uh, if everything went well during that um, grace period. Um, so, so it's often kind of changing underneath us, and so it's, it's difficult for us to put a precise number on it. Great. Well, thank you right. for those questions. If you think of more, we can certainly um, address them near the end of the talk and in between. Um, 
I wanted to go ahead and introduce our next speaker from the Royal Society who might um, talk a little bit more and cover a couple more questions. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Rhiannon Meaden from the Royal Society. And Rhiannon is currently a senior publishing editor at the Royal Society with responsibility for the day-to-day -day running and strategic development for the Society's flagship biological research journal, Proceedings of the Royal Society B, Biological Sciences. She also has responsibility overseeing the publishing performance of one of the Society's open access journals, Open Biology, and has previous experience working on acquisitions as well as launching and developing open access journals in a previous position at an open access publisher. So... Starting here, take it away, Rhiannon. Okay, thanks very much, Meredith, for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak briefly today about data archiving policies and how to ensure compliance with those policies. So um, I'm going to start today by giving you a bit of background information about our data archiving policy um, and putting that into context. I'll then focus the rest of the talk on issues surrounding compliance. Um, including how to enforce data archiving policies. These are the 10 journals that are published by the Royal Society. There are uh, three journals, um, Biology Letters, Royal Society Open Science, and Proceedings B, which have submission systems which are integrated with Dryad. Um, I'm actually the publishing editor for Proceedings B, so a lot of what I'll discuss today will be relate directly to Proceedings B, but I have included information from the other journals as well. Um, so this is a section of our data archiving policy, which applies to all of the Royal, Royal Society's journals. Um, obviously, I don't expect you to necessarily read all through this now, um, but I've included a link to the website where this can be found um, at the end of my presentation. Um, the key message here is that we require authors to make the raw data underlying the findings of their paper available, and that that can be either in a data repository or in the supplementary material. So the data archiving policy at the Royal Society is um, relatively recent, um, having only been in place since 2012. Um, the policy was first established in reaction to recommendations made in the Royal Society's report, Science as an Open Enterprise. Um, following the recommendations made in this report, our journals began to require data deposition. In 2014, three, the three journals I mentioned a moment ago integrated their submission systems with Dryad in order to make this process easier for our authors. And then in 2015, as an outcome of the Future of Scientific and Scholarly Communication events here at the Royal Society, our policies began to be policed and enforced more strictly. So it's really only in the last um, kind of year or so that we've re been really policing these policies very strictly and making sure that all of the data really is being deposited um, in, our, in our journals. So uh, moving on to compliance with these data policies, I've listed on this slide uh, several of the most common reasons that we come across for our authors not wanting to make their data available. Um, I'm sure that many of you will recognize most of these concerns. Um, they're fairly common in, um, in, in most of the journals that, that we're looking at. Um, I'd just like to very briefly flag um, just one issue surrounding long-term data sets as a particularly common problem in our journals. I won't go into detail regarding specific arguments relating to long-term data sets, as I believe Emilio will speak later about um, long-term data sets and the challenges that they present in a bit more detail. Um, but I have just uh, referenced an article here um, by Mills et al., which, again, I'm sure a lot of you will already be aware of, um, but it kind of outlines some of the main arguments that we see frequently from our authors. Um, surrounding long-term data sets. So moving on to some possible solutions that we've put into place. Um, this list of solutions on, our slide, on this slide is um, obviously not all of the solutions possible, but these are just some of the things that we're doing to um, try and make the process as straightforward and easy as possible. Um, firstly, um, I'd, I'd just like to kind of note a couple of things of importance on this slide. Um, so... Firstly, is um, enabling embargoes and allowing exceptions. 
Um, so while a clear data policy is important, there needs to be at least an element of flexibility in the policy to deal with issues arising for individual manuscripts on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and secondly, I'd just like to draw your attention to the importance of clear author guidelines. Um, so, in order to ensure that authors can easily find, read, and understand our guidelines, we've included full and detailed guidelines on our policy page, and this is a screenshot of our page on this slide. Again, I don't expect people to read this, and um, there's a reference at the end to this page at the end of the presentation. Um, we also include a shorter summary of the policy on the individual journal pages for authors to read. Um, this is just a screenshot of that statement on the Proceedings B um, page for uh, open data. So moving on to um, how we enforce these policies and ensure that authors do comply with um, the policies that we've implemented. Our primary problems regarding policing and enforcing our policies relate to resources. Um, with infinite resources, we could manually check through data sets for all submissions. Um, however, uh, particularly with Proceedings B, um, we just receive far too many submissions to make that possible. Um, we receive almost 3,000 submissions a year, so um, that's just not possible for us with our in-house staff. Um, so we've needed to implement some streamlined strategies for checking that data complies with our policy. And I'm just going to uh, talk you briefly through a few of them. Um, firstly, we include a question in the submission form for all authors. Um, it acts both as a reminder and a checklist. So a reminder for the authors that this is our policy and a checklist for our in-house staff to ensure that we flag any manuscripts where the authors haven't agreed to make data available. We also include a question in our reviewer form so if the data has been made available to the reviewers, they can check that through as well. We include reminders about uh, our data requirements in all decision emails where authors are being asked to revise their manuscript and resubmit. We also require authors to include a data statement in their manuscript detailing how to access the data. And this is always checked um, in any manuscripts that are being accepted in the journal, they have to have this um, statement at the end. So we always double check that before acceptance. And finally, if we're ever unsure about um, whether the correct data has been deposited, we um, have an expert editorial board and uh, we ask our editorial board members to advise in these cases. So let's look at how well those strategies have worked for us. Because authors can deposit data in a range of places, we have no overall statistics on compliance. What we do have, however, is detailed information regarding packages deposited in Dryad. As you can see from the graph on this slide, deposition in Dryad has increased year on year since our data policy was implemented in 2012. It's also worth noting that only 51 out of 639 packages that were deposited up, deposited up until the end of last year were placed under embargo. So that's roughly only 8% of um, data packages. And that um, maybe implies that the majority of our authors are making their data available immediately on publication. Um, so actually, not a huge number of our authors do require embargoes, although, of course, that is available should they want it. Um, so the graph on this slide is taken from a recent article by Simon Evans in PLOS Biology. Um, it's just showing the um, impact really nicely of uh, implementing a data policy on data deposition. Um, so Meredith spoke a moment ago about um, the impact of the joint data archiving policy, and uh, this graph shows this for three of the journals that implemented this policy in 2010. Um, it also shows um, that Proceedings B implemented two years later in 2012, where the blue arrow is pointing. Um, we can see a large increase after that point in the Proceedings B number of data packages submitted. Um, so it's an interesting that there was that two-year difference um, in both implementing the data policy and then in the number of packages being archived in Dryad. Um, in summary, uh, when 
considering also compliance with data policies, you need to first ensure that you've created a clear policy. Then you need to implement the policy consistently, reminding authors of the policy wherever relevant. And finally, ensure that the policy is being enforced, but be practical. Um, some flexibility allows for exceptions, which will inevitably need to be made. Um, thank you very much, and um, I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Um, so, Thank you very much, Rhiannon. We really appreciate that. That was a um, very nice overview and talk. Um, I would encourage folks to go ahead and put a question in, see if you have one. And I am trying to enter into the questions now. All right, so let's see. The first question I see for you, Rhiannon, is you mentioned that supplemental materials are permitted but discouraged. Have you seen the take up in supplemental mat materials decreasing in popularity? Have you seen any uh, results from that? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I actually don't have any data on the numbers of supplementary materials being published. Um, I'd say kind of anecdotally, I haven't noticed that fewer are being submitted. Um, what I would say is it may be that people are using the supplementary materials for different purposes. So it might be that perhaps raw data is being deposited in a data repository and supplementary materials are potentially containing other information relating to the article now um, rather than purely containing the data. But um, as I said, I don't have any data on that, I'm afraid. Okay, great. I've got one more question. So if anyone else has any questions, feel free to enter them in, and I'll read them. Did you have to increase resources at all for the change in 2015 enforcement of um, your data policies? Um, so uh, we actually uh, didn't increase resources specifically for that reason. Um, the journal's been growing kind of year on year anyway, so um, resources have been incrementally increasing over time. Um, which uh, helped with that increase in workload. Um, but actually, most of the kind of checklist of things that we're doing um, are reasonably straightforward. And once they've been implemented, it actually um, doesn't really require as much additional resources as you, you might necessarily expect. Okay, great. I've got a, another question here. Um, it is, does the Royal Society also require data citations to be included in reference lists, or is it only a data accessibility statement? And if so, how did that go? Um, so actually, that's very recently um, been updated in our policy. So again, a really good question and very timely. Um, I think it was only, in fact, within the last couple of weeks that we've updated our policies and we do now um, encourage data citations to be included both in the reference list and in the data accessibility statement. Um, at the moment we're not mandating that exactly so it's not being enforced as strictly as um, our data archiving policy is being enforced but I expect that kind of with time that's something that we may look at. I've got another question for you. Um, how often do reviewers raise issues or show signs of having looked at data in the repository during the review period? That's actually something that doesn't happen very often. Um, I suspect that that may be because um, actually in, in a, a number of manuscripts, the authors don't make the data available until after the review process. So although that question is there in the reviewer form, in, in a number of cases, the reviewers actually probably can't check the data anyway until later on in the process. Um, so it's kind of an additional check if the data is available, but it doesn't, it's not always going to catch everything, unfortunately. Okay. I think we've got time for just this one last question. Um, what was the rationale you had for the one-year embargo? Presumably that's not helping with the issue around long-term data sets. Is that just a way to allow people to feel more comfortable um, for pu with publishing data in general? Yeah, so um, you're totally right. That doesn't really help with long-term data sets. Um, most authors would prefer a much longer embargo for a long-term data set. 
um, I think with the one-year embargo, um, it's really just a case of giving the authors kind of slightly more additional time to ensure that any other papers that they kind of have under review in other journals that are relating to that data set um, have a chance to kind of be published and, and get out there before the data is um, the data's made available. Um, I appreciate that it doesn't necessarily address all of the concerns that people might have around making their data available, but it's kind of a, a compromise there between having it available as, as soon as we can while kind of appeasing the, our authors in, in as much way as we, we possibly can. Yeah, sure, understood. Certainly there's a level of compromise involved in, in anything that's still on the cusp of some culture change. Thank you very much, Rhiannon, for your um, presentation and, and answering these questions. Um, we'll have time at the end if anyone has other questions that they'd like to direct to the Royal Society. But now I'll go ahead and move forward and introduce um, Erica Newton from the British Ecological Society. Erica has worked in the publications team of the BES since 2011. She's currently responsible for the management and strategic development of two of the BES's journals, as well as actively exploring opportunities to bridge the gap between academic and practitioners working within ecology. Erica's role also includes liaising with authors and other team members regarding compliance with the BES's data archiving mandate. And prior to working in publishing, Erica carried out a PhD and worked in as a postdoctoral associate in the field of ecology, so it's well formed about the uh, life cycle of research. So, thank you and welcome, Erica. Thank you very much, Meredith. Um, so, the British Ecological Society has been publishing ecological science since the society was first formed over 100 years ago. The BES owns five international journals which you can see on the slide, and has been supporting data archiving since 2011. In mid-2012, a formal policy was introduced that informed authors they were expected to archive the data underlying their publication. And this was based predominantly on the wording presented in the JDAP, the, journal, the Joint Data Archiving Policy. Since January 2014, the archiving of data has been mandated for all um, for all papers. The policy that we have allows authors to archive their data in any appropriate repository that meets our criteria for public access and guarantee of long-term preservation. The journals are all integrated with Dryad and the BES funds deposits for all papers published in our journals. We recognize that this is a developing area and the policy needs to fit a continually changing landscape. So the policy is reviewed by the Society's Publication Committee annually, and it was actually updated last year. Um, in this, we added more detail and some new steps for situations where the authors of the paper don't own the data. So, for example, when the data has been collected or curated by a third party. So in these situations, the authors are now required to contact the data owners, outlining the importance of archiving for long-term preservation, and ask them if they're going to be willing to archive the data. Um, while this situation actually only applies to a handful of papers each year, we found a few data owners do actually allow their data to be archived when asked, and it also seems a worthwhile step in terms of raising awareness about preserving data. So this graph shows the total number of deposits in Dryad for all five of the BES journals, and as you can see, the uptake by authors when archiving was expected was fairly low, even though the journals were integrated with Dryad and funding any data deposits made during this time. Uh, it was only when we mandated data archiving as a condition of publication that we started to see a lot more data being archived. So Dryad is the, currently the major repository used by our authors, and in 2015, the percentage of articles depositing data in Dryad published in each of the BES journals ranged from about 43 to 77%. Um, now, that figure of 43% was for the methods journal, which by its nature just has fewer data, fewer papers presenting new data requiring archiving. But the percentage of dried uptake in the other three journals was all above 60%. Our policy also allows authors to be granted waivers and longer embargoes in exceptional circumstances. And authors of any paper can choose to archive, sorry, embargo their data for up to a year without informing the journal. Um, as we were among the first ecology journals to mandate data archiving, it was very important to incorporate some flexibility into the policy. 
The good news is that we haven't seen our submissions drop since mandating archiving and building this flexibility into the policy also hasn't really led to a huge number of requests for exceptions or long embargoes. Um, to illustrate this, I've got some figures from last year. So out of 450 data deposits in Dryad, 58 authors opted for a one-year embargo, and just seven deposits received longer embargoes. And these longer ones tend to be requested when um, a research project is in its early stages. So, for example, at the start of a PhD, in order to ensure that the student has primary access to the data until they've finished writing up. We also granted a total of six complete waivers last year. Um, this is normally where data includes information on locations of endangered species. So our processes are fairly similar to the ones that uh, Rhiannon has just outlined. Um, our authors are required to respond to a question on their intention to archive on first submission. Our rejection rate is fairly high, so it's only really at the revision and resubmission stages that authors must tell us where they will archive their data um, so that we can check the intended repository um, if necessary. And then the very final version must include the full data accessibility information before we send it to production. Information on how to prepare the data statement and cite the data package are provided to authors during the final stages. Um, and again, like the Royal Society, we don't check the, the content of data packages, but the assistant editors check the links and the accession, uh, accession numbers or DOIs are present in the paper. Um, for new repositories that don't mint DOIs, we will look at how the repository is funded or supported, their process for downloading data. For example, is there any login barrier, um, that they've got a clear policy of, that it's public, publicly accessible. We check that authors aren't allowed to take down data sets or amend them without clear versioning. Um, and we also ensure that embargo links or statements, if they're granted, are included in the metadata. Um, if there are any, any questions or any uncertainties, then the editorial office staff go back to the authors to clarify or sometimes suggest alternative repositories if necessary. So all these checks are carried out by the editorial staff before the articles go to production, and we find that this works better because our assistant editors only work on one journal and they're fully aware of the BES's policy, whereas production staff tend to deal with many journals. Um, but we did also ensure that our typesetters style sheets were updated with the format for data, cita data statements and citations in the reference list. The assistant editors also check the final proofs to ensure the correct presentation of data citations in the final article. So here's an example of a typical data accessibility statement with the data package cited in the text just in the same way as a journal article, so with the name and the year after the, the, the repository information. And then when the data is archived with a DOI, the citation also has to be included in the relevant place in the reference list with the author names, the year of archiving, data from and the title of the paper, and then the repository name and the unique URL. So where are we moving from here? Well, the main focus of the BES's policy to date has been to ensure the long-term preservation of ecological data, but we do recognize that ensuring researchers who do archive their data receive credit is the next important step. So to help this, we aim to soon be encouraging authors to cite any previously published data used in their paper within the main article. Um, this is because references need to be included in the main paper to be properly indexed and receive citation credits. We also are aware that there's a lot more work to be done on data reuse etiquette. So, for example, when is it appropriate to contact the data collectors and perhaps investigate opportunities to collaborate? Um, this is quite likely to vary by discipline, um, and best practice and general etiquette really needs to be led by the community. So our plan is to work with our editors to produce best practice guidelines for ecologists to help the long-term preservation of data become the norm. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Erica. Sorry about that. I was trying to find my mute button. That was very, <laughs> um, very nice overview. Um, I have a couple of questions. I can kind of jump right in. Can you speak at least uh, or a little bit about what principles you might follow in granting custom links embargoes? Yeah, so everyone is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Um, and we really leave it up to uh, sort of the editor's discretion, and it's a discussion between the, the author, the editorial office staff, and the editor. Um, and what we're really asking for is the authors to justify and give good, solid reasons about why um, an embargo, particularly a very long embargo, is justified. Um, there aren't really any too many general principles. Um, it's just... Uh, sort of I guess, common sense and, um, and and good, solid reason behind the embargo. Great. I've got another question here. Um, what feedback can you share, good and bad, do you get from authors on adding data citations to reference lists? Um, so we don't, don't really get an awful lot of feedback. Um, quite a lot of them forget to add the, the data citation to the reference list. So we tend to add that either in-house or go back to the authors. Uh, if we haven't got enough information, go back to them and, and tell them that they need to do that. Um, uh, I think generally it's, it's seen as, as being a good thing because they're, they're getting sort of a, an extra citation out of citing their data within the paper as well. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, quite quiet on feedback. Okay. Um, perhaps it's still coming. <laughs> what, Maybe. Um, can, what can you say uh, about any observations or any changes in author responses you have seen um, from authors being asked to share data as your policy has, invo has evolved towards mandating? Yeah, there's not been... Um, We've not really seen a huge amount of negative feedback. Um, it may be that, that we're aware that it could be that, that we're not receiving feedback. People are perhaps choosing to submit elsewhere. Um, the, the major change really in the policy was when we went from uh, requiring to, sorry, uh, from recommending to mandating. Um, and a lot of the feedback we received then was just uh, uh, mostly around clarification or a lack of understanding. Um, the the major the, the major update that I mentioned last year um, only affects a minority of papers, um, and other than occasionally seeing extra data sets that we otherwise wouldn't have pushed to archive, actually being being in an archive, um, we've not seen a huge amount of feedback there either. Mm, interesting. Great. Well, thanks very much, Erica. Um, I think that's it for our questions. If anyone again comes up with some brilliant question in a few minutes, please feel free to submit it. We might have some time at the end before our program ends. Um, so I guess for now, what I will do is move on and introduce our last speaker of our uh, three-person panelist. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Emilio Bruna from the University of Florida. Emilio is a professor of tropical ecology and Latin American studies at the University of Florida. He's a member of the Board of Directors at Dryad since 2013. Thank you, Emilio. And he has served as Editor-in-Chief of Biotropica, which is the Journal of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. So please go ahead, Emilio. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and thank you very much to all of you for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the process by which we and navigated the implementation of our policy, which has only begun um, this year. So we don't have much to report in the way of results yet, only about um, you know, how we arrived at, at uh, the implementation of a policy. And I'm, I think it's important to start by mentioning the fact that we are a society journal, and the reason that this is important is because our members and our authors and the concerns that they might have um, were really central to the way in which we went about negotiating um, and discussing this policy and the kind of manip the changes we made in our policy relative to others to help with some of the perhaps unique concerns, perhaps not, that they had. Our society has about, oh, 800 or so paying members, uh, another 250 or so non-paying members. These would be mainly students um, who get free access um, to the journal or, you know, but not necessarily all of the discounts that come with a membership. But it's important to emphasize that these, um, these members are based in about 60 to 70 countries throughout the world. Um, and that includes a lot of developing countries, as you might expect, given that the focus of our society's research is in promoting an awareness and understanding um, of tropical biology and tropical ecosystems 
um, their complexity and also the issues surrounding their conservation. So not only are we working um, a lot in developing countries, uh, but a lot of our society members and also authors are therefore based in these countries as well. In fact, if um, you take a random year of our journal, Biotropica, uh, we get about 430 submissions a year. About 40% of those submissions are from Latin America. And if you look at the 100 or so papers that we actually publish in a given year, um, they include authors from about 45 countries, including, uh, depending on the year you look, about 25 developing countries as well. So it's a really diverse um, author base. It's a really diverse member base. And that research is done in countries that um, span, span the globe from American Samoa to Zimbabwe, over 90 countries represented in about a 10-year survey of, of our um, journal. So there's universal agreement if you ask our authors and our society members that access to data is really critical to not only studying but conserving tropical ecosystems and developing policies um, to promote their conservation. So the question we were faced with as we were preparing to develop a, a data archiving policy is, you know, why are authors, especially from developing countries, often reluctant to archive data? So we have seen in a previous presentation a lot of the reasons, some of which won't be a surprise to anybody, um, that, that people have when they're first approached with the possibility of archiving data and what goes into it. But I think there were some other issues that are really important for tropical biologists, um, regardless of where they're from, um, but especially for some of our society members that were really important to be cognizant of. This includes, um, you know, kind of really they break down into three basic ones. Um, you know, part of it is that it's some pretty slow biology in many cases. These are systems in which um, the research can take a really long time, either because things like tropical trees micro really slowly or they're um, slow to collect the data that goes into the research. It's often in very difficult to reach places, so um, you might be able to go once a year to collect some data. A lot of the research that's done is on um, seasonal or even annual um, is on a seasonal or annual basis, and you often need multiple years of data to go into a study that ends up published in our journal. And so a, a lot of this kind of adds up to just uh, very long-term data sets or data sets that have taken a very long time to collect, even if they themselves don't encompass multiple years of data. Uh, the second issue that's um, certainly relevant is that the research is often very expensive. If you're not based in a tropical country, there's a lot of expense that goes into reaching your field sites and collecting the data that you need for your studies. But if you're actually in these countries, not only are you faced with some of the financial e expenses as well, but you also live in what's often a very um, uh, fluctuating environment in terms of science investment, be it from national science agencies or um, philanthropy or other kinds of sources. Um, you know, in the in the past year, the example I have there is that um, Brazil's Ministry of Science, a former Ministry of Science, has just had a about a, a billion reais the local currency cut from its budget, and that's going to have a huge impact on the type of, of research that gets done. And what you see in many cases, which is people investing their own personal funds into collecting data that goes into their work. Um, so it's expensive to do, not only by its very nature, but often um, because of the economic and political climate within the country in which it's being done. And finally, uh, I, I think it's really important that we, we can't uh, ignore the cultural legacy in which our research is being carried out, and that is that there is a, a long history of kind of parachute science, of intellectual exports, so researchers coming from outside of the tropics into the tropics to collect data um, and leave, often without any kind of engagement or collaboration with local scientists. Um, and also, um, you know, our, the kind of the emblematic of this is, you know, the legacy that um, Henry Wickham, for instance, who's the photo that's represented here, uh, exporting uh, uh, seeds of um, um, rubber trees to Royal Botanical Gardens Q from the Amazon, which ultimately led to the collapse of the rubber industry. And, and you, you cannot, if you work in some parts of this world, ignore the legacy of um, this kind of um, and kind of uh, what you'll often hear referred to as uh, scientific or academic imperialism. So um, the lack of engagement often that we see is something that's really important. And that's um, 
And that's because these data sets then represent, for many researchers, the only control they have over the way in which their data are used. And in many cases, it's the only way in which they can guarantee co-authorship on studies as well. And so um, maintaining access to data, um, which you would be giving up in some ways, right, by, by making it available on an archive then, is a, also a means of giving up control over um, things that people have worked a really hard time to collect within this broader cultural context that's, um, that's already challenging to work in in many cases. Um, there's, um, the flip side of that is, of course, that there's also a recognition that access to data is also really important for our members and our scholars who are in developing countries, um, not only for research and policy and conservation, but also for capacity building as well, because that means that their own students will be able to do research with open data sets. So that's, um, you know, that's the conundrum we're faced with. On the one hand, we recognize that the community, which perhaps um, has the most to benefit, um, the most to gain from access to data is also potentially facing the greatest risk when freeing that data up for others to use, especially in a world in which we have a, the emergence of these very um, synthetic um, data uh, studies using data sets from all over the world. Um, and so how to resolve that? And that's what we were faced with. And I think it actually turned out to be relatively straightforward and relatively easy for us, but only because all the pieces were in place. And so I think that the first thing that was really important is that there was already support from the society leadership, um, from our executive director um, and uh, to our other officers and also the council, um, and also the editorial board of the journal. So they were predisposed to consider this and work on crafting a policy that worked for us. Um, it's important to point out that both our executive council, our society leadership, and our journal editorial board are already international in nature. So this made it much easier to both um, be aware of any potential concerns that people had, but also our editorial board is then able to serve as our ambassadors within their own countries and to their own scientists when it comes to discussing this policy. The second thing that was really important was a very open and frank discussion well in advance of any of the issues that might come up. We drafted a really good summary of the various pros and cons that uh, data archiving might bring to both the journal and the author's publishing in our journal. Um, we discussed this, and I think that the thing that um, really helped us a lot when we were thinking about implementing our policy was we got our biggest critics on board helping us to write it. And that by doing that, that meant that the major concerns that they had, we put them in charge of writing the section that addressed those concerns. And so that meant automatically when the policy was put forward to the editorial board for a vote, we had already taken care of a lot of the concerns from the people who would be least likely to support them. And I think that sense of empowerment and engagement was really, really important. And when we did this process of both discussing the major issues and uh, figuring out how to address them, we really came upon three of them. The first, I've already um, kind of led you to it, which is the fact that the, not only is the science perhaps slow, but also the rate of publishing is also slower for a lot of our scientists in different parts of the world um, for either differences in the incentive structure in the universities or the fact that they're also um, burdened with all kinds of other responsibilities that researchers in other parts of the world aren't. And so we went with a longer embargo period as a, just a starting point. Our current embargo period is three years rather than the one year that you might have heard about earlier from the BES journals. Um, in practice, we'll even consider longer ones if um, if any of the authors get in touch with me, we're really flexible. I support that idea as well, and we'll discuss the possibility of longer ones for longer-term data sets. Um, the second issue which came up was uh, the financial issue, um, which is that it, it can be uh, you know, expensive, especially relatively expensive to some of these um, authors to deposit the data sets in archive. And so the way we dealt with that is that we freed up some money in our office budget to defray the cost of archiving entirely. So depositing your data in Dryad won't cost you a cent if you're an author publishing in Biotropica. Um, we don't even ask for a waiver, in fact, although that may change. We may move to a waiver process to allow those people who can afford the deposition uh, prices to take care of them themselves, um, or even to allow people to just help offset the cost with whatever they can. Um, but the way we've budgeted now in advance is simply that we will pick up the price for that entirely. And that way we don't put an additional financial burdens on authors who are already facing the challenges 
of um, a, you know kind of a changing financial climate. And then the final thing, um, and this came up in our uh, previous presentation as well, is that it was really important for us to take an active stance in promoting a culture of collaboration. When we were drafting our policy, we looked all over the place for language that actually um, encouraged people to work with the people who were collecting data. And we couldn't find any, so we decided to put it ourselves. Now, there's no enforcement mechanism here. The data are publicly available, so they're to be used by others. But we thought it was important to actually jumpstart that cultural shift that was alluded to earlier by putting the language explicitly in the policy itself. And that is... Um, that the Board of Editors of Biotropic encourages authors who reuse archives to include as fully engaged collaborators the scientists who originally collected them. We think it makes sense. It makes the science better. It gives you better insights into the way in which the data were collected and the biology of the system. It reduces errors. But we think this is really important because the promoting of collaboration is something that's um, at the core of our mission as a society, and so we see it as being central to the way in which we operate as a journal as well. And so... I'll leave it at that. We've um, just implemented the policy now, so maybe in a year I'll have some information for you on how it's gone, but I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has them about how you might navigate the implementation of a policy and addressing the concerns that people have. Thank you very much, Emilio. That's very, uh, that was a, a very interesting. Um, I, I, I kind of found it very interesting, the, the collection of data collection as kind of a personal slash political reflection of, of research. That's so very interesting. We've got a couple of questions here. Um, that we can go into, and also I'll encourage everybody to just go ahead and put in some questions, and feel free to direct them to Emilio, or I can also start to open it up to um, the other speakers that we had today. Uh, the first one, specifically Emilio, um, says, when you're talking about um, protecting data collectors, the question mm -hmm. is, wouldn't making the data citable and something you can refer to as a way to actually protect um, data collectors? Was that an argument you made or, or something? Uh, oh, no, we, 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 certainly, we certainly emphasize that by making data citable, that does give you a, something that you can uh, show um, as being important in terms of use, and it's certainly something that you know, people can put as a metric of the impact of their research, but, uh, but citations don't get people promoted um, uh, you know, um, of, of data quite yet. We're working on making that cultural shift here. Other places are even further behind than we are. And so while it definitely does offer people a reward for archiving their data, a quantifiable and, in my opinion, very important reward, the fact is that authorship is still the, you know, the currency by which advancement is judged. And so by losing co-authorship on papers, the, the fact is that a lot of our authors are paying a penalty, if you would. And so we, that's why we are actively working to encourage the collaboration because, um, and a true collaboration, not simply putting someone's name on your paper because you use their data, because that allows people to both um, change the culture and get the kinds of rewards um, that the institutions for which they're working, um, are, that they're still recognizing. Sure. Uh, I've got another question here um, that, that says, what happens when there are updates in long-term data sets, for instance, species name change or data corrections? Well, that's a really, really good question that I'll actually um, turn over to you and Todd because I'm curious about that myself. Um, <laughs> well, I know um, in Dryad's case, for instance, um, we certainly, with the help of our curators, are able to version data sets and encourage um, authors to go ahead and upload corrected versions. We're pretty familiar with this process happening, um, you know, after the review process, for instance. If a, if a um, paper has gone through the review process and they found a, a, something they'd like to switch or found an error of some kind and that perhaps they might have some data to replace, they can upload the data and then we will version out so that you can see the the original and grayed out version and then be led to the actual accurate version. Um, so that's how we would handle any sort of changes. But on the Dryad side, of course, we look to the author or the editor coming to us with those changes or with those updates. Yeah, that's, and that's, it's important also to emphasize that our authors are not required to archive in, in Dryad. They can ar archive in any, um, in any repository that's appropriate. Um, and, but if they choose to do it in Dryad, because we're integrated as a journal, um, that's why we cover the expenses for them. So 
Um, that, that makes it an easy decision maybe for someone who hasn't really given a lot of thought to where they might archive. Um, whether other depo- you know, repositories also do this kind of versioning, I'm not sure about, but that's another reason why we thought it was important to, to go with Dryad. Sure, and we, thanks, we thank you and the Society for your support. We've got another question here, um, and it's, are there concerns about the independence or perceived independence of reanalysis or reuse of data from the original investigators? if there are co-authorship requirements or permission? Um, so, I'll, in two parts. One, uh, our policy does not have any kind of co-authorship requirements. So that final portion was that we're encouraging collaboration um, and co-authorship, but it's, it's not at all required. And I am sure that there are concerns about um, whether someone is a co-author or not about the way that the data are being used um, and reanalyzed. And presumably those that, that's what the importance of of a true collaboration is that you uh, can have those kinds of frank discussions with your collaborators um, to, to let them know that the data are, are being used properly or, or not. So while we don't have that requirement, that's exactly the reason why we wanted to encourage collaboration because, because that makes those concerns easier to air and easier to address. Sure. Now, I, I had a question, Emilio, if you can speak at all about how long your process was from policy development to implementation. I was taken by your um, comment about um, encouraging your largest critics to get really involved in the process. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and how, how long it took to complete. Yeah, uh, it actually it, it didn't take nearly as long as I thought. I mean, it, it took, uh, you know, from the, from the day we started putting pen to paper until we actually had the final vote, um, you know, certainly less than a year, but that's because it was interspersed with all the other things that we've all got going on, right? So, you know, the <laughs> academic year and teaching and research and all those, all those kinds of things. Um, the vote itself was really, really quick. Um, and, and then the, um, the drafting of the policy itself, I would say if I, you know, including the back and forth with people that we were discussing it with, we were fortunate that there are some really excellent policies out there to work with. We use the uh, British Ecological Society uh, policy is a is a really important model in the Ecological Society of Americas as well, and uh, and so that gave us we already had a lot to work with because other people had already done the hard work of crafting the original policies. So I would say the the whole process took less than a year, but that's because um, you know things move slowly. Uh, probably in all honesty, it, we could have gotten it done in in under a month, month and a half if we wanted to. Great, impressive. Well, thank you very much for your time um, and your talk. That was very interesting. Uh, we have uh, now come to the end of our program today. So before we sign off, which would be maybe a little bit early, um, I wanted to just take a minute to thank everybody and also encourage if there's any other sort of general questions for the panel, um, if you have any remarks or any things to share. Um, we certainly have panelists still on, uh, on the call now that we can go over some general questions. Um, I'd like to see... I see that Monica put a note. Of, there's a few things going into the chat saying that they enjoyed the talks and also the system. They found it easy to interact. So that's really good feedback. Um, some of you also have my um, email. I'm going to put my email here in the chat. So you can also send me um, any, uh, any comments or, or, or anything from the system. We do appreciate uh, your feedback very much. Um, so I guess that's pretty much the end of our program. I'm going to hand it over to Todd again just to kind of close us out. And again, you know, if you have questions or anything left you'd like to um, put forth, please go ahead and put it into the chat or the question window. So thank you, everybody. And over to Todd. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so great. That was, uh, that was really good. So uh, while we're waiting for any uh, final questions to come in or comments, um, I just want to remind folks that the election is open. We'll uh, we'll keep it open at least for a little while uh, to make sure we have quorum and uh, possibly uh, possibly a bit longer. So, um, if you haven't voted yet and you are a member, please uh, please do so now or or remind your your delegate at your organization to do so. Um, there's both the board election and the bylaws, and uh, it's you know, critical that the membership weigh in and exercise their their governance stake in the in the organization. Um, also, um, as we heard, the slides will be available and the video will be available uh, down the road. And so, uh, we encourage you to to pass this around if there's 
uh, useful information, a uh, lot of a lot of good issues raised about crafting a data policy uh, for specific audiences and, and uh, specific author communities and reader communities that uh, I think would be great to share with, within your organization. And we'd love to hear feedback about ways that we can better support um, the needs that journals have in, in carrying this out, because that's really the um, that was what was built into the DNA of the repository from the beginning was that the um, policy is something that uh, the repository can't impose on the community. It has to be from the community and from the societies and journals that, uh, that actually are responsible for crafting it. So with that, uh, thanks again to all our speakers. Um, are there any further questions that you see that have popped up, Meredith? I do not. Just one that you addressed from Amy asking if this would be available online after. And of course it will. And we'll send a um, notice out to all of our registrants and to any of the registrants who registered and weren't able to actually join that this will be available. And we encourage you to short share it with your um, colleagues. Okay. Thanks a lot. And with that, goodbye, everyone.